Hello, my name is Eben Leder. I am a student of Arthur Green, and I teach in the Rabbinical School of Hebrew College in Boston. As the pandemic stretches out, we find ourselves approaching the high holidays still committed to social distancing. While the resulting loss of a physical community of prayer and service has been felt strongly by many of us over the last few months, approaching the high holidays without gathering in synagogues seems to rise to yet another level of difficulty and alienation. In anticipation of the upcoming holidays, I have been asked to address the particular challenges of participating in prayer services being held online and to think about the ways one could make the most of this situation. I have only very simple things to say about this question, which most everyone already knows, but I hope there is value in bringing the different practices together and setting them in the context of prayer during social distancing. Also, while I will not talk much about this, it is important to remember that this whole conversation happens in the presence of people who have been devastated by the loss of loved ones, devastated by fear, hurt by loneliness, making any discussion of prayer more poignant, more raw, and more urgent. It seems to me that one of the most important terms to bring to mind in this conversation is preparation. In order to make the most, or sometimes even just in order to make anything out of a spiritual practice, one must prepare for it. This is one of the important lessons of the Jewish calendar that teaches us to begin preparing for Pesach a week before the month of Adar, to begin preparing for Shavuot on Pesach, to begin preparing for Tisha B'Av on the 17th of Tammuz, and in relation to our current season, to begin preparing for Yom Kippur and Sukkot at the beginning of the month of Elul. Our small daily practices need preparation as well. The words of the prophet Amos, prepare for the presence of your God, was taken in the Talmud to relate to the processes one could go through every day in preparation for standing in prayer. There is a wonderful story in the Talmud about a certain widow who lived next door to a synagogue yet went daily to participate in prayers in the study hall of Rabbi Yochanan. One day he said to her, My daughter, don't you have a synagogue in your neighborhood? To which she answered, My master, do I not benefit from taking steps? Rabbi Yochanan took her very seriously and taught this widow's answer to his students. What he learned from her is the importance of transitioning into prayer, of taking real physical and mental steps towards your practice. This widow, who sadly is not named, seeks out a more distant praying place in order to benefit from the transition time in which she has stepped away from other occupations and is taking steps towards her prayer. I admit to a certain sadness about the way our society cultivates an addiction to cell phones that has almost eliminated the transition quality of going to any place, let alone a place of prayer. I doubt that this widow used her walking time to have another meeting on the phone, or that Rabbi Yochanan would have been as impressed with her practice if she had. But if cell phones changed the nature of the walk to prayer, COVID-19 eliminated it. Unless we pay attention, there is likely to be no transition time from everything that is happening around us to the prayer service, no period of taking steps towards prayer. One of the lessons we must learn for this period of social distancing is to consciously create the sort of transitions that our social reality created before, sometimes without our even noticing. It is worth noting in this context that taking steps towards prayer is ritualized in the traditional practice of taking three steps 
to the place you will pray before beginning the Amida. But with real and true respect to that particular realization, we need to ask practical questions about the steps we can take towards prayer when it happens in the midst of our homes and our lives. What do we do with the physical space and our physical bodies to orient ourselves towards tefillah? Of course, there are many additional aspects of our prayer life that are changed when the social setting shifts. When you go to synagogue, you are part of a prayer group just by being present. And if your personal capacity to engage in practice is not at its best on any particular day, you can usually trust the energy of the group, the people surrounding you, to help orient you back towards practice and maybe even carry you over some rough spots. When you sit alone in your room and everyone except for the prayer leaders is a muted picture on the screen, the power and benefit of just being present is greatly diminished. Where once the people singing around you might have easily lifted you up, now you have to find ways to consciously cultivate a sense of both presence and participation. The literature of Jewish practice includes many practices for orienting yourself towards prayer. For those interested in traditional forms of such practices, Rabbi Yosef Karo collected many of them in chapters 90 through 96 of his Shulchan Aruch Or Chaim. At times, they are helpfully categorized as practices for preparing the space, the body, and the mind. I will give some examples from this literature that I think could be useful for us from each one of these categories, but I would like to offer a small caveat before doing so. Social distancing has posed different challenges to people in different life stages and situations. I myself am the parent of young children, so I am most attuned to the unique challenges social distancing has posed to people with children at home. I have found long before the pandemic that the old rabbinic statement that women are exempt from time-bound practices applies equally to parents of any gender who are responsible for their children. With children in the sphere of your immediate responsibility, it becomes extremely difficult, not to say impossible, to commit to a particular quality of spiritual presence at a particular moment. Ultimately, it is the children who will set the spiritual agenda. A situation that has become even more pronounced when we are spending so much of our time together at home. So I say the following especially to parents who are struggling to find a place for prayer in their life, although at a certain level this applies to everyone. The various preparations I am about to discuss can be useful and important, and if you invest in them and it works, that's great. But if you are trying to invest in such practices and your child comes and throws a wrench into the whole process, have compassion for yourself and for the child. You may find it helpful to say, as Rav Zalman Shechter of Blessed Memory taught me once to say, Ah, Ribbana Shalolam, I see you want me to do the daddy thing now. I will do it for you. A good place to start with physical steps towards tefillah is preparation of the body. Many of the traditional texts start the process by stopping before going to pray and asking, do I have to go to the bathroom? This may seem like a simple question, a question we would ask a young child, but actually asking myself this question before beginning prayer expresses a commitment to be present. And further, it turns my attention towards my physical being and presence as significant in the act of prayer. It may actually be the case that before the pandemic, 
I would ask myself this question before leaving home, which was not unique to going to prayer. But asking it before prayer, even as I stay at home, turns the question into a conscious statement of intention regarding my presence in the upcoming prayer. Another practice discussed in many of the sources is washing hands before prayer. Like most of us, I have been washing my hands much more often since the pandemic began, and I have noticed that hand washing has become a pretty regular ritual of transition upon getting to a place, leaving a place, finishing a meeting, ending an activity, and on and on. This merges rather well with the ancient traditions of hand washing, though specifically for prayer, I am partial to the traditional form of just letting water flow over your hands, connecting to the experience of flow and of change and of the possibility of renewal. Most of the Talmudic texts responding to the verse from Amos that I mentioned earlier, prepare for the presence of your God, discuss specific articles of clothing that people put on before beginning to pray, a belt, a pair of shoes, a jacket, and more. The general quite simple message is, don't stay in your pajamas. Get dressed to pray and wear something that will make you feel like you have committed to being present. In the age of Zoom, I might say, put on a presentable pair of pants. Of course, no one else will see them, but this getting dressed is not for anyone else. It is for orienting yourself towards what you are doing. The last, but definitely not least, on the list of body preparations is physical posture. You can find various suggestions in the text about how to stand, when to sit, what to do with your hands, etc. Without going into details, here too I would recommend going back to Amos. Prepare for the presence of your God. Pay attention to your body. Notice the feelings and attitudes that various postures evoke in you, and try to adapt something that is conducive to productive practice. A few thoughts from the sources about preparing the prayer space. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says that when practicing hitbodedut, which is individual conversation with God, a person should go out into the fields. Because in the city, even if you are alone at this moment, the space still carries the echoes of everything that had happened before. And these echoes will, will or may distract you. Thankfully, he also says that when there are no other options, you can also create a space for seclusion with God, even in a crowded room, just by pulling your talit over your head and face. But one way or the other, it is certainly worth thinking about the impact of the space we are praying in. This is especially significant now, as most of us have moved our prayers out of synagogues, which Hasidic stories describe as having walls coated with prayers from the past, into other kinds of spaces, a move which can have both positive and negative impacts. It is worth worth thinking about the place you chose for participating in the Zoom service. What do you usually do in that space? And is it conducive to focusing your awareness on prayer? In our apartment, for example, I often go to our small balcony to pray, as I find it to be the place least cluttered with the residue of other activities I do at home. Sometimes changing a small thing, like the direction of a chair, can create a new space out of an old space. If, for example, you are sitting in front of the computer at a desk, Clearing the desk from other kinds of clutter can make a real difference in the capacity of the space to support the tefillah. This is also why the Talmud suggests having a set place for prayer. Even if other things also happen in the room, or for that matter, on the computer you are using, if you return to it again and again to pray, it begins to develop associations and connections to that activity. 
Another Talmudic recommendation is that when praying inside, you should choose a place where there is nothing between you and the wall. While the literal application of this recommendation may not always be possible, it is certainly worth paying attention to what is in your field of vision and hearing when you choose a place at home to participate in prayer. What kind of environment is created by the things you see around the computer screen and when you raise your eyes from it? And along the same lines, I think, is the recommendation of Rabbi Chia Bar Abba in Tractate Brachot, a person should always pray in a room that has windows, especially as we dive deeper and deeper into a world that is completely manufactured by human hands and brains, keeping non-virtual windows open to a world greater than us seems to me an excellent bit of advice for entering a mindset of prayer. A few more small things that may fall under the category of preparing the mind. It could be very helpful to get to the place you are going to pray and organize the space before the service starts. If you can, finish organizing a few minutes before the service starts and sit quietly waiting for it to begin. Having lost the physical action of going to synagogue to pray, creating some quiet time of transition can be very important to your capacity to pray along with the service that is happening online. There is a Hasidic practice known as Hitkashrut that I have found to be very helpful in these times. The word Hitkashrut means connection, and the practice is to take time before praying to visualize and name specific people that you would like to connect yourself to in this act of prayer. So a Hasid would typically say, I connect myself to my Rebbe, so and so and perhaps name some other significant people, alive or dead, that will create his personal context for this prayer. When naming them, he would visualize their faces either as he knew them or as they were imagined. I have found that naming a community of prayer, some of whose faces may appear on the screen before me, and some whom I may imagine, indeed helps me feel more connected and less alone in my prayer. On Zoom, I strongly recommend clicking on the hide self view option. Now, spiritual practitioners spend years trying to achieve this high rung, yet Zoom offers it with just one click. But seriously, I find staring at myself most distracting. In general, unless you are speaking, I would recommend not staring straight into the computer. Sit at something of an angle from the screen so you are aware of what is happening and can turn towards it if something significant is happening, but I do not find the posture of watching the screen to be conducive to prayer. On the other hand, I would recommend, if appropriate, leaving your camera on as an act of generosity towards the other participants. While it can be difficult to feel connected to the small images of people on the screen, a screen full of name holders can feel even more alienating. It is very helpful for prayer to have your actual sitting be an act of generosity. There's a very old tradition to give something, even if just putting a small coin into a tzedakah box before prayer. In the Talmud, Rabbi Elazar connects this practice to the verse from Psalms, justified, I will see your, meaning God's, face. By substituting tzedakah, which means charity, for tzedek, which means justice, he comes up with a reading of the verse that says, through charity, I will see your face. But this new rereading of the verse can go in more than one way. 
It may indeed be that our act of generosity brings us into God's presence, but that may well be because the invitation into God's presence is itself an act of divine generosity. When our act of giving creates a world or even a moment of generosity, we too can become recipients of generosity. I've tried to highlight some of the traditional forms of preparing for prayer that I thought would be useful for our current situation. My recommendation is not that you try to do all of them, but rather that while keeping the goals of orientation and preparation in mind, you choose some physical elements that will help you get more out of the online service. And who knows? We might be successful in creating some good habits that will serve us well even when this pandemic is over. May that happen soon, speedily in our days, and may it be a good year for everyone. And let us say, Amen. <laughs>